I actually think, having thought about this for a few days now, but really in a lot of detail and depth last night when I was sitting on my Todd in a, a tube station, I think that one of those elements, one of those things that Mikel Arteta has been super insistent on when it comes to bringing in players has actually, in an indirect way, caused us a problem. So on this episode of the Chronicles of Aguna podcast, we are going to discuss the problem with Arsenal's transfer strategy. Before we dive into the problem, let me make it clear. I'm not sitting here and saying that Arsenal have been awful in the transfer market, that Arsenal have got things horribly wrong, generally speaking. I think generally speaking, Arsenal have been really good when it comes to recruitment over the last few years. But at the same time, we've spent a lot of money. Um, you know, we have managed a big turnover in the squad and we end up in a position where even now I look at certain areas of our team and I think we're not quite good enough there. And if we're not quite good enough in the starting 11, you know, then that's obviously a major problem. But I think because of the nature of football nowadays, there's so many games, so many competitions and all the rest of it. I think that you also need to be good enough in terms of what you can bring on to backfill some of those positions when you're suffering with injuries, suspensions, needing to rotate due to fatigue and all the rest of it. Now, if we start off with trying to get into kind of Mikel Arteta's head, and again, you know, there are positives to highlight, but the purpose of this show is to try and identify what I believe to be a problem and to try and, well, I've identified it in my own head, but to try and articulate to you guys what I think is a problem. So forgive me if I sound like I'm being overly negative, but I, I do think there is an issue here and it's one that I hadn't really thought of too many times before. Um, it did cross my mind once. I remember having a conversation with somebody about it. Um, I don't think we spoke about it on a podcast, but I think this is something that is causing us a problem at the moment. So I mentioned all those things, right? I mentioned the things that I think Mikel Arteta is really big on. So when it, I think there's a lot of things that we've kind of tried to um, look for in players when we go out into the market, right? I've mentioned them already, versatility, certain age profile, a certain level of experience. There have been other things as well that Mikel Arteta has been really big on and really keen on uh, and has seen as a bit of a non-negotiable, really, when it goes into... Um, when it comes into those kind of negotiations and identifying the players that we want. The thing that's bitten us in the arse a little bit, I think, is the fact that we've gone so big on versatility. Now, I wouldn't quite put it the way that Mark's put it in the chat, but I get where he's coming from. He says, I thought you were going to say that we've got loads of jack of all trades, but masters of none. I guess in a in a kind of way, that's what I'm saying. Um like, I wouldn't go as far as saying or, or using that phrase, jack of all trades, master of none, because I look at some of the players that we've got. So, for example, Tommy Asu. Let's take Tommy Asu. He's a really versatile player. He's a good example. Tommy Asu is someone that could play right back really competently, could play left back competently, and could play as a centre back competently. If Takahiro Tommy Asu was on the team sheet in any of those positions, I wouldn't be concerned. Not in the slightest. I wouldn't be worried. I wouldn't be going into the game stressed, um, you know, anxious about what we might see. I trust him to work in all of those positions. Jurian Timber is another example of a player um, that ticks these boxes in terms of versatility, right? Someone that can play right back, centre back, left back, no problem. You could even argue with Jurian Timber that you could push him into the midfield if you wanted as well. And that could work in theory. So it's not that I don't trust these guys in multiple positions and it's not that I don't value their versatility. I think that's a really great trait to have. The problem is, is that when you try and cover multiple positions with one player, one injury can then leave you short in more than one area. Does that make sense? So let, let's, let's, let's take it like this, right? If you can hear screaming outside, there's like a fox and a dog having a fight or something. I don't know what's going on in my next door neighbor's garden. Um, but anyway, if you've got players that cover you in multiple positions, so let, let's take the, the two good examples of Tommy Asu and Timber, right? You went into the season and you go, okay, in terms of specialist centre-backs, we have got Jakob Kivior, 
backing up Saliba and Gabriel. But that's not a problem because you've got Timber who can back you up anywhere across the back line. You've got Tommy Asu who can back you up anywhere across the back line. And you've got Ben White who can play at centre-back as well. So although in terms of players that you have earmarked only as centre-backs in your squad, there's only three, there are other options, right? But if you're relying on Timber or Tommy Asu to be your cover at right back and at left back, one of them getting injured has a real big impact, a big significant impact, because you're now down to your bare bones, not just in one position, but in a multitude of positions. Versatility is great, but when you build a squad around that idea and that concept, there is a chance that you will be short in more than one area, having suffered only one injury. Now, I'm not saying that we've only suffered one injury this season. I'm well aware that we've suffered a lot of injuries. I'm well aware of how unlucky we've been with certain players. Thomas Partey comes into the season. I know people will say that we should have seen it coming, and I was one of those people that said that. But last season, he was available for 33 of our 38 league games. So was there a feeling? Did Arsenal kind of get sucked into this kind of false sense of security with Thomas Partey. Well, look, he seems to have come through the worst of it now because he was available for 33 of our 38 games last year. If so, I still think that's naive because the previous couple of years were so bad, in my opinion, with injuries that we should have been more on top of that, more alert uh, about that and more sort of open-minded to that possibility. We shouldn't have based the strategy around him being fit all the time because it just doesn't happen anywhere near often enough. But the point I'm trying to make is that, you know, if you if you think about it and, and look, again, it's, it's not even that I agree with the approach. I'm just trying to get inside the manager's head. I'm trying to think about what he would have been thinking. So he would have thought, I'd rather spend more money on certain players. Players that will be of a higher caliber then try and cover loads of positions with the money I have available to me. So what I will do is I will try and find versatile players. So where people say Jurian Timber cost £35 million, whatever it was, I can't remember the figure off the top of my head, but whatever the figure was, then you look at it and you go, is that a lot of money for Jurian Timber? I don't think it is in, in the case of Jurian Timber. But you look at it and you go, okay, I'm spending that money, I'm making that investment not just on a right back or a left back or a centre back, I'm making that investment on someone that can cover me in all those positions. So to the club, that investment is justified. When we signed Kai Havertz, I said to you guys at the time, before we even got linked with him, actually, if you go back to the one of the pods I did, it was like a summer wish list thing. I said that if Kai Havertz was available for a reasonable amount of money. Now, I don't think £65 million is a reasonable amount of money. I think we we paid way over the odds for him. Nobody's ever denied that. But I looked at Kai Havertz and I thought, he's a player that, you know, given we're talking about versatility, and that was very high on the agenda clearly last summer, I looked at him and I thought, you could come in and you could play as a centre-forward, you could play as a second striker, you could even play right or left if you really needed to, and you could probably play as an attacking midfielder without too much defensive responsibility um, if we needed you to do that as well. So I thought if you could pick him up for like £30 million, because I knew that you'd have to pay a, a little bit more given who you were signing him from and all the rest of it. I thought actually that might not be a bad bit of business. I think we certainly overpaid for Kai Havertz, but we've paid it now. And I'm not going to sit here and pull him apart every week and blame him for, for defeats that I don't think he's culpable for necessarily on an individual level. But I guess, and again, this is not my opinion. This is what I think the club would have gone through. And this is what I think maybe Mikel Arteta would have thought when sort of convincing Edu and co to kind of sign off on this deal. I think the thinking would have been, well, if Kai Havertz is going to come in and give us cover as a left number eight, as a centre forward, then it's like we're bringing in two players. So we don't mind spending that extra bit of investment. If you, Mikel, are happy with the idea of Kai Havertz covering you in a couple of positions, I don't mind sanctioning a bigger transfer fee, transfer spend, whatever. 
And again, I'm not even saying I agree with this. I'm just trying to break down the process I think probably occurred and the conversations I think probably happened when these deals were being signed off and when these deals were being sanctioned. So I've gone around the houses a little bit, but the point I'm trying to make is that in going for versatility, in putting our eggs in that basket, in being happy to spend more on individual players, given the the knowledge that they could play in a multitude of positions. Yes, we have a group that is smaller than a lot of other groups. And I think Mikel Arteta likes that. I've talked about it before. I think it's something that he's, you know, he's, he's determined to have is that he's a smaller, more connected group. Um, you know, that can be a good thing in some cases, but it can also be exposed when you pick up a number of injuries, as we've seen in recent years and in recent times. But I think he was trying to think along the lines of, I've got to maximise what I can spend, but I also want to stick to my um, idea of having a smaller, more connected, um, more united group of players. I don't really want those types of players hanging around the place that are never getting a game. And we'll come on to the criticism that Mikel gets and has been getting a lot over the last couple of weeks about the use of the squad and the use of some of the players that are maybe on the fringes a little bit. We'll do that in a minute. But just to kind of round off and summarise this point, if you're going big on versatility and you look at players as a solution to multiple issues, when you lose those players, you are up shit street, is the point I'm trying to make. Because it doesn't matter how many positions you see them covering. um, It's only one body. So when you lose that body, it has a domino effect on other areas. It, do, do you get the point I'm trying to make? Like, let me know in the comments. Do you agree? Do you disagree? Do you think I'm talking out of my backside? Do you think I'm overthinking this? I just, I was thinking about it last night and I thought, if you're reliant on sort of these versatile players and you're going through your team, looking through each position, assessing the options you have, but there are players whose names are under multiple positions. When you lose that player, you end up losing cover in three or four areas, which can have quite a big impact. So while it might be a good way of of investing, um, you know, within your means and making sure that, um, you know, you're getting the best possible players for the money you have, you're still not actually adding maybe enough bodies to the picture. And therefore, when you do pick up a few injuries, you look short. That's That's what I've been thinking about. I think it's particularly true at the back. I think it's particularly true at the back. I think as well, you can use the example of of Kai Havertz too, because, you know, for for me, Kai Havertz, when he's played as a centre forward for Arsenal, he hasn't been amazing. Um, You know, I think his finishing has left a lot to be desired at times, particularly in that Liverpool game recently. But I thought he was effective in terms of the build-up. I thought he was more effective than Eddie Nketiah would have been in the build-up. And I think that's why he was selected. I think that selection was justified in that sense. But there have been times where you've not been able to use Kai Havertz as a a, a different option up front because Fabio Vieira has been injured, Emil Smith-Rowe has been injured, Leandro Trossard as a left centre midfielder doesn't really convince me. And so, yeah, you might have done it with the intention of thinking, I don't need to go and buy another striker because Kai Havertz is going to give me something different. That's something different to what Enketia and Jesus offer. But if you're also using him to cover another position and that position is a problem, then that has a knock-on effect. Do you see what I'm trying to say? So do we have enough bodies in the building of the standard that we require? I would argue no. I think when everyone's fit, we've got a good squad. And I think we've got a squad that gives the manager options because of the versatility of so many of these players, because it can help us to be unpredictable. But do we have enough bodies? I don't think we do, because I think we've gone down this road of prioritising versatility over the number of bodies. Now, that might be something that we felt we had to do because of, um, you know, what some of these players are costing nowadays. But I just, yeah, I, I don't know. I keep going around in circles on this in my head, but that's kind of what I was thinking last night, what I've been thinking throughout the day. And I wanted to share it with you guys and get your thoughts in the live comments as well. Um, we're going-